I want to thank everybody very much for coming tonight. Welcome to the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. My name is Carl Laird. I'm with Students for a Democratic Society. SDS, along with the Muslim Students Association, Student Labor Action Coalition, and the Students for Justice in Palestine, are privileged to welcome our speaker tonight. Norman G. Finkelstein is a political scientist who specializes on Jewish-related issues, particularly the Israel-Palestine conflict. As the situation in Israel and occupied Palestine have become more violent in the past few weeks, it is important to have an honest voice shed light on what is happening and how the conflict can be resolved. Dr. Finkelstein is the son of Holocaust survivors. Of the many values his parents instilled in him, they taught him the need to speak out against crimes when they are being committed in relative silence. He has held faculty positions at Brooklyn College, Rutgers University, Hunter College, New York University, and most recently, DePaul University. Amidst considerable public debate, he was denied tenure at DePaul University in June 2007 and placed on administrative leave for the 2007-2008 academic year. On September 5, 2007, Dr. Finkelstein announced his resignation from DePaul. I had the pleasure a week ago today of talking to another champion of Palestinian rights, Professor Noam Chomsky. He has no shortage of praise for Finkelstein and his work and explains regarding the tenure denial that Finkelstein had the support of his whole department and virtually everyone in his field. His tenure was turned down by the administration in contradiction to his faculty after a vicious propaganda campaign mostly launched by a law professor at Harvard University, Alan Dershowitz. After attempting to prevent the publication of Finkelstein's most recent important book, Beyond Chutzpah, partially a rebuttal to Dershowitz's A Case for Israel, he resorted to outright slander. Dr. Chomsky explains that it's perfectly obvious why Dershowitz would resort to slander because Finkelstein exposed him as being a liar, charlatan, and an apologist for Israeli atrocities. Aside from Beyond Chutzpah, Finkelstein has written five other books, including The Holocaust Industry and Image and Reality of the Israeli-Palestinian Conflict. After the lecture, there will be a question and answer period and a book signing following that. Norman Finkelstein is one of the most prominent and controversial figures in American academia today, and he shows that intellectual rigor is a must in the pursuit of truth. I'm privileged to introduce you all tonight to Norman Finkelstein. Well, thank you for inviting me. I don't think I've been to Milwaukee before. At least it doesn't seem familiar, this room. Have I been here? Marquette. That's in Milwaukee? Yeah, okay. I'm from Brooklyn, I, I know Manhattan and Queens. Um, well, uh, I was told that uh, Wisconsin went overwhelmingly for Barack Obama, and whatever you think of, whatever you think of uh, Barack Obama, I think it's, a, it's one of those cases where you can agree with uh, Barack Obama's wife when she said that she's really proud to be an American now. And for those of us who lived through the pre-civil rights era, uh, I really think it is a testament to the American people and how far we have traveled uh, in coming to our senses and behaving like relatively decent human beings, at least to one another. Uh, the topic I want to talk about this evening is one that has more and more intrigued me in recent years, namely, if you Look at the documentary record on the Israel-Palestine conflict, namely the past or the historical record, the present, which basically means the human rights record, and the future, which basically means how do you resolve the conflict. If you look at the documentary record in the Israel-Palestine conflict, uh, it's remarkably uncontroversial. Uh, there is a broad consensus on what the history shows. There's a broad consensus 
on what the human rights record shows, and there's a broad consensus on how to resolve the conflict. And yet, when you enter into the public arena, the arena of public debate, there's all of this controversy that swirls around the Israel-Palestine conflict. It seems so complicated. And the question I want to look at this evening is how do you account for all of this controversy swirling around the conflict which, if you look at the actual record, it's remarkably uncomplicated. And the argument I'm going to make this evening is that most of the controversy swirling around the Israel-Palestine conflict, the vast preponderance of the controversy, it's conjured up, it's fabricated, it's artificial, it's fake. And the purpose of this fake controversy, this artificial controversy, is to divert people's attention from what the record shows and to divert a people's attention from what the documentary record shows. Let me begin with a relatively straightforward, uh, simple illustration of the argument I want to make tonight. In July 2004, the International Court of Justice, the highest judicial body in the world, it rendered a landmark advisory opinion on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Formally, the question it was asked to address, the General Assembly referred a question to the International Court. And the question was, is the wall that Israel is building in the occupied West Bank, is that wall legal under international law? What's the legal status of that wall? And the court eventually ruled that under international law, the wall is illegal, it has to be dismantled, the Palestinians have to be compensated for the damage already done. That's the better part, that's the part of the uh, advisory opinion that's better known. But it's not actually, in my opinion at any rate, the most significant part of the advisory opinion. Because for the World Court to reach the decision that the wall was illegal, it had to answer a whole number of other legal questions. And it turns out that those legal questions it had to answer first are what are called the most controversial questions in the Israel-Palestine conflict. So those of you who are familiar with the lingo of the Israel-Palestine conflict, there is first of all this thing known as the peace process. Most of you have heard of it. And then within the peace process, there's this thing called the final status questions. How many people have heard of the final status questions? Okay, this is a relatively informed audience. Final status questions basically refers to those issues bearing on the Israel-Palestine conflict which are said to be so controversial that they have to be put off to the end of negotiations till the final status questions can be resolved. And those final status questions are typically said to be four. Those of you who are familiar with the topic, you can uh, confirm whether or not I'm, what I'm saying is true. The four basic questions are usually said to be borders. What are the legitimate borders of the Israeli state and what should be the borders of a future Palestinian state? Number two, the question of the settlements. What's the legal status of the settlements that Israel has built 
in the occupied territories. Three, the question of East Jerusalem. Under international law, to whom does East Jerusalem belong? And number four, <coughs> excuse me, and number four, the question of the right of return of the Palestinian refugees. What rights do they have under international law? There used to be a fifth question, the question of water, but that's pretty much been, uh, pretty much disappeared from the agenda. Now, of those four questions, borders, settlements, Jerusalem, and the right of return, it turns out that the International Court did decide on three of the four questions. For example, or in specific, number one, the question of borders. The International Court said it's a tenet that is a fundamental principle of international law that it's illegal to acquire territory by war. That in the modern world, you can't conquer territory by virtue of war. Israel conquered the West Bank and Gaza in the course of the June 1967 war. Therefore, under international law, it has no right to those territories. Those are not, as we're often told in the public arena, those are not disputed territories. Those are occupied Palestinian territories. Throughout the International Court's decision, it refers to occupied with a capital O, Palestinian with a capital P, and territories with a capital T. The occupied Palestinian territories. It refers, as the court says, to the whole of the West Bank and the whole of Gaza, because the whole of the West Bank and the whole of Gaza were conquered in the course of a war, and that's illegal under international law. Number two, the question of the settlements. Under international law, in particular Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, it's illegal for an occupying power to transfer its population to occupied territory. Therefore, said the court, the settlements, all of the settlements, are in the words of the court, a flagrant violation of international law. They are not disputed settlements. They are a flagrant violation of international law. We turn to the third question, the question of Jerusalem. We're often told that next to the refugee question, that's the most complicated one of all. And in fact, Israel claims East Jerusalem as part of its eternal and undivided capital, to use the official language. But not so, says the highest judicial body in the world. East Jerusalem was conquered in the course of the June 1967 war. That means it is not Israeli territory. Israel has no right to East Jerusalem. It's occupied Palestinian territory. If you read through the World Court decision, it refers to the West Bank, comma, including East Jerusalem, comma, and Gaza, as occupied Palestinian territory. There is no dispute, there is no contention. It's as lucid as any phrase might be. Now, some of you might think, or an argument has been made, 
that the high, the world, the International Court of Justice, sometimes called the World Court, that it's biased against Israel. An argument could plausibly be made in that regard, had it been the case that this opinion of the high of the World Court had it been close. But what's remarkable about the opinion is it wasn't close at all. The vote was 14 to 1. The one dissenting vote to which I'll return in a moment was by the judge from the United States, uh, Judge Bergenthal. But this was a remarkably uncontentious vote. Even on issues which you would think were no-brainers, take the question of the legality of nuclear weapons. In 1996, the International Court of Justice was called upon to render a decision on whether the threat and use of nuclear weapons was legal under international law. To simplify matters, but not, I don't think, to falsify them, to simplify matters, the most fundamental principle of international law when it comes to war, it's called the principle of distinction. That is, the distinction between combatants and civilians. And under international law, you're not allowed to target civilians, only combatants. Everyone in this room knows that. Well, the question arose, given that nuclear weapons cannot discriminate between civilians and combatants, they're incapable of making that discrimination by their nature, are these weapons legal? It would seem to a lay person, well, the answer has to be no. Nonetheless, on that particular question, the vote was very close. It was a tie, and it was broken by the president of the court at the time. So even on that fairly straightforward question, it was very close. But on this question, it wasn't close at all. The vote was 14 to 1. Or take another example. Some of you in this room have memories that go back to the U.S. illegal war against Nicaragua in the 1980s. And in 1984, the Nicaraguan government took its case to the world court, whether it was illegal for the United States to mine the harbors of Nicaragua. Again, when you look at the court decision, it, uh, once more it seems like a no-brainer, uh, but when you look at the court decision and you look at the what's called the opinion, then the separate opinions, then the declarations and the dissents, it's a, not so complicated, but it's a complicated procedure, it comes to a hefty thousand or so pages of debate, discussion, and exposition. But when you come to this particular case, the one on border settlements, Jerusalem, it, the whole thing, main opinions, separate opinions, declarations, dissent, the whole thing comes to less than 100 pages. The point being, there's nothing to debate. There's nothing to discuss. These are the most basic principles of international law. You're not allowed to conquer territory by war. For those of you who, whose memories reach back to 1990, 1991, that was exactly the statement that President Bush Sr said to Saddam Hussein when he invaded Kuwait. It's illegal to acquire territory by war. The settlements, it's a no-brainer. The language in Article 49 couldn't be clearer. And Jerusalem was conquered in war. 
as I said, even the case of Judge Bergenthal, who cast not a dissent, but he used the more nu neutral language, what's called in the parlance of the International cor Court, it's called a declaration. He begins his declaration by saying that there is much in the majority opinion with which I agree. And then remarkably, bear in mind, this was the only negative vote, Judge Bergenthal says on what's the crucial question really, namely those settlements which constitute the main obstacle to resolving the conflict, Bergenthal says there can't be any question. Those settlements, says the American judge, who incidentally is also a Holocaust survivor, but the American judge says as well, those settlements are illegal under international law. And he goes on to say, if Israel is building the wall to incorporate the settlements, then he says that wall is, quote, ipso facto illegal under international law, which is to say that on the fundamental questions, what we're told in the public arena are so controversial, so complex, that they have to be put off to the final stages of negotiations, that the entire court, all 15 judges, agree there's a consensus on what is right and what is wrong what is legal and what is not in the Israel-Palestine conflict. And that returns me to the topic this evening. If it's true that even on these most contentious issues, there's no contention at all, then how do you account for all the controversy? Before I get to that, I want to use this time to just briefly review what that record shows. Obviously, time doesn't allow me to go into any depth or detail, but I can illustrate the point with several examples. So let me begin with the history. I notice there are a few oldsters in the room still wearing their tie-dyed T-shirts and their love beads still chanting, give peace a chance, and still stoned. <laughs> I went to a potluck dinner this evening. There was no luck and there was no pot, there, just potato chips. Um, for those people whose memories stretch back in the Israel-Palestine conflict, the most controversial question in the, in the history of the conflict, I think people will agree, and I would want, of course, to hear from you if you don't, but the question always used to arise, say, in the 70s and the 80s, the question always used to arise was, how did those Palestinians become refugees in 1948? For those of you who are new to the topic, in November 1947, the United Nations General Assembly votes to partition Palestine. And almost immediately after the partition resolution is passed, a civil war breaks out in Palestine. And then in May 1948, when Israel declares its independence, an interstate war breaks out in, Pal in, in the area or I should say in Palestine. Uh, January 1949, when the interstate war ends, approximately 750,000 Palestinians find themselves outside of their homes in the area that became Israel. And the question arose from then thereon, how did those Palestinians become refugees? <laughs> 
the standard claim of Israel, and it became the claim which was echoed in mainstream scholarship. The claim was, in 1948, the Arab armies from neighboring states stood poised to invade the newly born state of Israel. They then transmitted radio broadcasts, the Palestinian population to leave their homes, clear the way for the invading Arab armies, and once the Arab armies had thrown the Jews into the sea, the Palestinian Arabs would be able to return to their homes. How many people are familiar with that argument that used to be made? Raise your hands up high. As you can see, that was what we were told. And um, as I said, it was the dominant claim in most of the scholarship on the topic. Come the late 1980s, a large number of researchers, notably the Israeli historian Benny Morris, investigates the record. And Morris, like all the other historians, reaches the conclusion there's no basis for this claim of Arab radio broadcasts. It was simply fabricated. Uh, and Morris then went on in, s in later years to acknowledge, and I'm using his words, that what happened in Palestine in 1948 was an ethnic cleansing, his phrase. And that has now become the broad consensus among historians. There is some debate, I don't want to dispute that, but the amount of debate is relatively narrow. The question arises, was this ethnic cleansing premeditated, that is to say intentional, or was it simply the consequence of war? We all know wars breed refugees, and was it just an accidental con uh, consequence of war? Morris held the position that it was an accidental uh, uh, an ac accidental outcome of the war. But to give you an indication how narrow the debate is, you take the case of Shlomo Ben-Ami. He's Israel's former foreign minister, the foreign minister in the late 1990s through 2000. He's a very smart guy. Um, he's a historian by training. A few years ago, he wrote a book entitled Scars of War, Wounds of Peace, came out from Oxford University Press, and he at some point has to address that question, how the Palestinians become refugees. And he says, well, I agree with Morris. It's clear from the record that they were ethnically cleansed in 1948. But he says, and here we're speaking about the former foreign minister, but he says, I don't agree with Morris, it wasn't accidental. He says it was, to quote his words, it was anchored in the Zionist philosophy of transfer. In layperson's language, all along the Zionist movement was intending to expel the indigenous population. Come 1948, under the cover of war, it had the opportunity to do so. And then it did what it had always intended to do. And so now you have the remarkable fact that on what used to be considered the most contentious issue in the history of the conflict, Israel's former foreign minister taking the most extreme position critical of the state of Israel. Another interesting example, and for those of you who are readers, and I hope that phenomenon still exists, uh, there's a very excellent book that recently came out. I couldn't recommend it more highly, by a Israeli, the former head of Israel's most prominent center for the study of strategy. His name, uh, the center is called the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies at Tel Aviv University. And the author's name is Ze'ev Maoz, M-A-O-Z. And the book is called Defending the Holy Land. 
And what the book is, it's basically a review of the whole history of Arab-Israeli wars. Who started what and why? It's a large book. It's about seven or 800 pages, but it definitely rewards a first and even a second reading. Time doesn't allow me to obviously go into the details. He does the 48 War, 56 War, 67 War, 73 War, Lebanon War, First Intifada, Second Intifada. It's quite exhaustive. Uh, and what I'll do instead of going through that record, let me read you his conclusions. Very briefly, I think you'll be surprised. Says the former head of the Jaffe Center for Strategic Studies at Tel Aviv University. He says, Israel's war experience is a story of folly, recklessness, and self-made traps. None, N-O-N-E, none of Israel's wars with a possible exception of the 1948 War of Independence, none was a war of necessity. They were all wars of choice or folly. Israel's decision makers were as reluctant and risk averse when it came to making peace as they were daring and trigger happy when it came to making war. The official Israeli decision makers typically did not initiate peace overtures. Most of the peace initiatives in the Arab-Israeli conflict came either from the Arabs, from the international community, or in formal channels. When Israel was willing to make risks for peace, these usually paid off. The Arabs generally showed a remarkable tendency for compliance with their treaty obligations. In quite a few cases, it was Israel, rather than the Arabs, that violated formal and informal agreements. And during questions and answers, I would be happy to go through that history, which I know fairly well, and which I think he accurately renders, though I must myself express surprise that even in the case of the 1948 war, he calls it only a possible exception to the rule that all of Israel's wars were wars of choice. Now bear in mind, under international law, a war of choice means a war of aggression. Because under international law, you're only allowed to use armed uh, force if armed force has been used against you, Article 51 of the UN Charter. So in effect, what Ma'oz is saying is, all of Israel's wars were wars of aggression. Well, that's the past. What about the present? The present basically means the human rights record. What's going on in the occupied territories? And if you look at typical media coverage, I was very struck by it during Israel's recent invasion of Gaza. What typically happens, if I had the papers in front of me, I would read them to you. You have Israel's, excuse me, the New York Times' correspondent in Gaza, uh, Ms. Kirshner, and Kirshner will say something like, or she literally did say, that the Palestinians say most of the casualties were civilians. Israel, however, says most of the casualties were combatants. And then you're left to throw your hands in the air in despair. Who's telling the truth? Who knows what happened? But of course, in any other conflict in the world, we don't have those questions 
asked by reporters because what they do is they typically go to the local human rights organization or representative of a larger human rights organization or reputable human rights observers and asks them what happened, what are the numbers. So just as Ms. Kirshner was reporting what the Palestinians said and what the Israelis said, Beth Selim, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, it put out a press release and it said that the majority of those killed during Israel's recent assault on Gaza, the majority were civilians. And that's what I want to look at briefly, namely, in order to examine the human rights record in the occupied territories, the obvious place to go is the numerous human rights organizations which monitor what's going on there. As it happens, Israel-Palestine is probably the most heavily monitored area in the world by human rights organizations. There are the big organizations, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and then a whole slew of local organizations which seem to multiply like mushrooms after a rain. Uh, there is the best known being Bet Selim, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories, but then there's Physicians for Human Rights, there's the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel, there's Gisha, there's this, there's a huge number. And it's a very interesting fact because you have all of these organizations. They all have their own independent staffs, research staffs, legal staffs, field staffs. And a lot of human rights law is still very nebulous. That means it's a little bit fuzzy because human rights law is the most recent body. Of, it's, a, it's a very recent body of international law. And so a lot of the terms haven't been fully, um, fully defined. You often hear the term human shield. How many people have heard human shield? What that exactly means under international law is not entirely clear. Uh, when you try to investigate what they mean by that expression, uh, it's not entirely <coughs> obvious. So, for example, if you're in a city and you place a piece of artillery, not artillery, an anti-aircraft uh, uh, apparatus, what would you call anti-aircraft guns? Okay, anti-aircraft guns next to a apartment dwelling. Is that using... Uh, the apartment dwelling as a human shield or not. It's not really clear because if you're in a city everywhere there are people. So the terms aren't fully clear what they exactly mean. And then a lot of human rights work consists of uh, people going out and just observing. And as we all know, human beings are susceptible, vulnerable to error. So for example, human rights observers go out to a clash in Hebron, and they have to look on the Palestinian side. Did they initiate the hostilities? And if they did, did they use live ammunition? And if they use live ammunition, were they amid the crowd or in the periphery of the crowd? And if the Israeli soldiers initiated a clash, uh, did they, were they in a life-threatening position? Were they, uh, did they fire warning shots? Did they aim at the legs? Did they aim at the torso? Did they aim at the head? Those are all you know, considerations when you try to discuss the legality of what happened. And obviously there's a lot of room for human error. People see the same thing and they see it differently. What's really remarkable when you come to the Israel-Palestine conflict is notwithstanding so many different organizations and the nebulousness of the law and the vulnerability to human error, it's quite remarkable how little disagreement there is about what's happening there. For a book I wrote a couple of years ago, I sat down, I read through about 20 years of human rights reports. And that was a lot. It was in the many, many thousands of pages because these human rights reports proliferate at a very rapid rate. <clears throat> and what struck me in reading through all of these reports from a two-decade period
is that literally, this is not hyperbole, that's the fancy word for exaggeration, literally, uh, I was only able to find one case of one demonstration, one afternoon in one city where two human rights organizations disagreed about what happened. There is just no debate, no dispute, no contention, no controversy about what the actual record shows. So let's look at what the record shows on probably the most, uh, you know, the, the issue that's most frequently discussed in the news, namely deaths, fatalities in the conflict. As most of you know, in January 2006, the Islamic movement Hamas is elected to power in a democratic uh, election, which is certified by international officials as being uh, carried out <coughs> according, to, uh, uh, according to the norms of uh, holding elections. And immediately as Hamas was elected into power, uh, these fairly brutal sanctions were imposed on the government, first by the United States and Israel, and then subsequently by the European Union. And the justification of these sanctions against Hamas, which uh, for whom the Palestinian people, not Hamas, paid the biggest price, the justification for these sanctions, as all of you know, is it was said that um, Hamas is a terrorist organization, and or to enter the community of civilized nations, uh, it had to renounce terrorism, uh, the indiscriminate killing of civilians to achieve political ends. That's the conventional definition of terrorism. You're targeting civilians to achieve a political goal. And it seems to me that's a no-brainer. Uh, terrorism is illegal under international law. It's clearly immoral, and Hamas, like any other uh, political entity is uh, bound by the constraints of international law, has to renounce terrorism. Uh, that's, to me, an uncomplicated question. Uh, there are no caveats, no qualifications, except the obvious one, namely, whatever principle of international law you declare, it has to be applied across the board. If you apply it to all sides, that's called a moral principle. And if you apply it to one side, that's called a hypocritical principle. Everybody here understands that. So let's take this principle of terrorism for which Hamas was penalized and apply it across the board. Let's see what the record shows. Let's start with the raw numbers. Since the beginning of the second intifada, the dating from September 2000 to the present, Approximately 4,700 Palestinians have been killed, and about 1,050 Israelis have been killed. So in terms of raw numbers, it's about three to four Palestinians killed for every Israeli killed. I should bear in mind that when I'm giving the Palestinian numbers, I'm giving the bare minimum. I'm not including Palestinian children who are killed in the hospital because it's been deprived of electricity and I'm not including Palestinian mothers who uh, <clears throat> aren't able to give birth at, ch at checkpoints because they're not allowed through to hospitals. I'm just giving fatalities in clashes. The number is about, as I said, it's about three to four to one. Uh, if you look at civilian deaths, uh, the ratio of non-combatants, well, let me just change that for a moment. The ratio of um, combatants is about four to one. If you look strictly at civilian deaths, leave the combatants aside, the ratio is about three to four on the Palestinian side to about one on the Israeli side. Well, some of you may say, uh, okay, that sounds right, but aren't you leaving out a crucial difference? And the crucial difference usually goes something to the effect of, but isn't there a difference between Palestinians targeting Israeli civilians and Israel unintentionally killing Palestinian civilians? That's how the argument usually goes. 
And usually I think it's a wise strategy not to dismiss what your opponents say, but to try to systematically examine the claim for its factual and its logical uh, strengths and flaws. Well, let's see what the, the results show. You have a uh, reporter for the New Yorker magazine, this fellow named Jeffrey Goldberg. How many people know him? Not many, that's no loss. Uh, and Jeffrey Goldberg, uh, he's a prominent writer for the New Yorker, which in my opinion says nothing. And he recently came out with a book called Prisoners. And it was about his stint of army duty in the occupied territories. And at one point, Goldberg recalls a conversation he's having with a Hamas member. And he says to the Hamas member, for God's sake, we don't try to kill children. That's supposed to be the difference. Hamas tries to kill Israeli children, whereas Israel doesn't try to kill ch uh, Palestinian children. It's an accident. Prisoners. And it was about his stint of army duty in the occupied territories. And at one point, Goldberg recalls a conversation he's having with a Hamas member. And he says to the Hamas member, for God's sake, we don't try to kill children. That's supposed to be the difference. Hamas tries to kill Israeli children, whereas Israel doesn't try to kill ch uh, Palestinian children. It's an accident. So, what does the record show? 878 Palestinian children have been killed during the Second Intifada. That's more than the total number of Israeli civilians killed, 705, of whom 119 have been children. And the ratio of children, it's been about 8 to 1. For every eight Palestinian children killed, one Israeli child has been killed. So our preliminary conclusion would be, for the want of trying to kill Palestinian children, it would seem that Israelis were awfully good at it. Uh, is it even true? Is it even true that Israel doesn't deliberately kill Palestinian children? Well, that's not what the human rights reports show. Amnesty International says that on many occasions, Israel has deliberately targeted Palestinian demonstrators who are overwhelmingly children. And then it goes on to say that Israel indiscriminately, excessively, and disproportionately fires on Palestinian children. In fact, one simple statistic. Of the 37 Palestinian children killed in the first month of the second intifada, September through October, September 30th through October 31st, of the first 37 Palestinian children killed, fully 20 died from a direct bullet shot to the head. That's deliberate killing. Well, what about indiscriminate killing? Is indiscriminate killing different than deliberate killing? In fact, under international law, it's not. And under international law, you, uh, the foreseeable and inevitable consequences of an act count as intention. I know that sounds a little abstract and people are ready to tune me out, but in fact, it's not difficult to understand at all. Let me repeat. The foreseeable and inevitable consequences of an action count as your intention. What does that mean? If somebody nukes an anthill, it's redundant to ask, did you intend to kill the ants? The inevitable and foreseeable consequence of nuking an anthill is 
ants are going to be killed. You don't have to ask what the intention is. And the same way if Israel, Israel indiscriminately fires artillery into a civilian neighborhood and kills civilians, that's no different under international law than if you deliberately target civilians. And there are Israelis who perfectly well understand this principle. Take the case of the outstanding Israeli journalist Gideon Levy. He writes for Haaretz and he covers the occupied territories. And in November 2006, when Israel was indiscriminately firing artillery into civilian neighborhoods of Gaza, Mr. Levy had this to say, someone who throws burning matches into a forest can't claim he didn't mean to set it on fire. And anyone who bombards residential neighborhoods with artillery can't claim he didn't mean to kill innocent inhabitants. Therefore, it takes considerable gall, says Mr. Levy, and cynicism to dare to claim that the Israeli army did not intend to kill inhabitants of Beit Hanun. Notice his choice of words. When you indiscriminately fire into a civilian neighborhood, that is no different at all than the deliberate targeting of a civilian neighborhood. They both count as intention. Even Israel's leading authority on international law, a fellow by the name of Yoram Dinstein, a very smart guy from Tel Aviv, he's the president of Tel Aviv University, Unfortunately, when it comes to issues bearing on Israel, he is a hack, but he's very smart. And in his standard study of international law, he writes, and I'm quoting him, there is no genuine difference between a premeditated attack against civilians, which is what Hamas is accused of, and reckless use of force, which is what Israel is accused of. To quote him, they are equally forbidden. And therefore, the conclusion you reach is, the only differences between Israeli and Hamas terrorism are first, Israeli terrorism is about three or four times as lethal or deadly as Hamas terrorism, and two, no demand, let alone sanctions, has been imposed on Israel to renounce terrorism. Well, if you apply the principle of opposing terrorism to only one side, it's not a moral principle. It's simply an exercise in hypocrisy. Well, some of you are perhaps willing to go with me this far. It's a bitter pill to swallow, but I did quote Mr. Dinstein, Mr. Levy, it sounds right. Uh, but even if everything I say is true, what about resolving the conflict? Isn't that complicated? And how can I pretend it's not? Because were it not complicated, wouldn't it be resolved already? It's already 40 years. In fact, there's been a consensus in the international community for about three decades now how to resolve this conflict. And everyone in this room knows it it's called the two-state settlement. The two-state settlement means a full withdrawal from the territories Israel conquered 
in the June 1967 war. In accordance with that principle, it's inadmissible to acquire territory by war. Then there's also another fundamental principle of international law, namely every state, member state of the United Nations has the right to be free from the threat or use of force. Article 2 of the United Nations Charter. Therefore, the neighboring Arab states have to recognize Israel's right to be free from threats or use of force. And thirdly, the Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza with East Jerusalem should come into being, that being the two-state settlement of the conflict. Not particularly controversial, doesn't raise any complicated questions of international law so far as I could tell. And in fact, that's the opinion of the entire world community. 198, we know that. That's not speculation. It's not my opinion. It's what the record shows. What record? Everyone in this room can check for him or herself. All you have to do is go to the computer, go to Google, and enter the words peaceful settlement of Palestine question. And when you enter those words peaceful settlement of Palestine question, what will come up on your screen is the annual vote in the United Nations General Assembly every year in November and December they vote on the two-state settlement. And the vote is 1989, 151 to 3. The whole world on one side, the United States, Israel, and Dominica, the island state of Dominica, on the other side. I don't have time to go through the record for 30 years. I'll just quickly give you the vote. 1997, check for yourself, 155 to 2. 1998, 154 to 2. 2002, 160 to 4. 2003, 160 to 6. 2004, 161 to 7. 2007, 161 to 7. Now, though the, those of you whose critical faculties are activated, you noticed that the number, no doubt you noticed, leaped from 2 to a phenomenal 7. And it is true, there has been that quantum leap from 2 to 7. It's slightly more underwhelming when you realize that the 7 are typically every year, check for yourself, the United States, Israel, Nauru, N-A-U-R-U, Palau, P-A-L-A-U, Tuvalu, T-U-V-A-L-U, the Marshall Islands, and Micronesia. That's it. Now, for those of you who are slightly humiliated, embarrassed by the fact that you're college educated and you've never heard of Nauru, Palau, and Tuvalu, if it's any consolation, the combined populations of those mighty states could fill the empty seats in this room <laughs> with plenty of room left over. In fact, more room left over than we would like to think because due to global warming, Tuvalu won't be with us much longer. Uh, actually, no, don't clap for Tuvalu. No. Because the truth is Tuvalu dropped out. In recent years, it's no longer joined with the US and Israel, and I think it's because of the global warming. I understand they've been a leader in supporting the Kyoto Protocol. Uh, and that's been the case Literally, it's been the case for the past um, nearly now 40 years. So let me quote to you one of the leading uh, specialists in international law, a fellow named Quincy Wright. 
And this is what he writes in 1970, well before half of this room was even born. He writes, in view of the acceptance of UN Resolution 242, the main resolution, the Israel-Palestine conflict, by the adjacent Arab states except Syria, the major obstacle to progress seems to be seems to be the refusal of Israel to do so and to agree to withdraw from occupied territories. That's 1970. You fast forward to last year, 40 years later nearly, you open up Jimmy Carter's book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid, and what's his conclusion? Peace will come to Israel and the Middle East only when Israel is willing to comply with international law by accepting its legal borders. The same problem 40 years ago is the same problem today. That's the obstacle to resolving the conflict. Israel's refusal to withdraw from the territories it conquered in the June 67 war and to accept its legal borders. Well, we're going to try again that simple exercise of moral principle versus hypocrisy. The state has the right to be free from threats or use of force. If you look at Hamas's statements, some of them are uh, ambiguous, and others of them have been pretty clear. The most recent interview by Mr. Uh, Michel, uh, the most recent interview he gave in Al Jazeera, which reiterates many statements that they've made in the last uh, couple of years, uh, have agreed to recognize Israel on its June 67 borders. I'll agree the word, use of the word recognize is ambiguous, but willing to accept the June 1967 borders. So the worst you can say about Hamas is that its record has been somewhat ambiguous. Some statements clearly accepting Israel, others uh, more ambiguous. But what's Israel's record? No Israeli government, no Israeli political party, no major Israeli political figure has ever recognized a Palestinian state on the June 1967 borders. Its record is completely unambiguous. There is no Israeli government, political party, or major political figure that has, who has ever called for a full Israeli withdrawal from the territories it conquered during the June 1967 war. In fact, as the world demands that Hamas recognize Israel, the current Israeli government is building a wall which will annex between 10 and 13 percent of the West Bank, which will divide the West Bank into about six or more fragments which has effectively annexed the Jordan Valley and which will leave for the Palestinians about 50% of the West Bank. Or, as Israel's most influential newspaper, Haaretz, put it, between the eastward expansion of the Israeli settlements, the westward expansion of the Israeli settlements, and the expansion of the settlement blocks toward the Green Line, the Palestinians are left with no territory on which to establish a state. And so we're left again with that same conclusion. These aren't moral principles that are being applied to the Palestinians. These are not legal principles that are being applied to the Palestinians. These are hypocritical principles which are being applied to them. That to me as far as I could tell, is the documentary record on the conflict, the history, the human rights record, and the legal diplomatic record.
And if it is, as I claim, and as I think the documentary shows, the documentary record shows, if it's remarkably uncontroversial, then how do you account for all the controversies surrounding the conflict? And the main argument I would want to make is most of the art controversy is artificial. It's fabricated precisely to divert people's attention from what this record shows. It's not true to say that everything in the record is, excuse me, all the controversy is um, uh, fabricated. Um, there is some parts of the record which it seems to me they are real and we should be honest about them. And that's most notably the question of the Palestinian refugees, which I promised I would return to. So first of all, let's look at what these legitimate controversies look like. First of all, you can agree on facts but disagree in your moral judgment on facts. What does that mean? You take someone like Benny Morris, that Israeli historian who I said uh, was most responsible for clarifying the record and how the Palestinians became refugees. And Morris doesn't dispute that the Palestinians were ethnically cleansed in 1948. But Morris says, I don't think that was a bad thing. Sometimes, he says, ethnic cleansings are good things. And he gives the example of our own North America. He said that the, and I'm quoting him, the annihilation of the native population was a good thing because it allowed for the creation of the great American Republic. Uh, and he says that the main error that the Israeli leadership committed in 1948 is, what, is that they didn't expel all the Palestinians from what became Israel, from the West Bank and Gaza. And he said had they all been expelled, then we wouldn't have these problems today. Sort of like Germany exterminated all the Jews and so there's no Jewish problem in Germany today. If you leave aside people like Morris, uh, put them on the side, and then you return to the moral universe of most normal human beings, you still have perplexities because you can agree in your factual judgments, you can agree in your moral judgments, you can agree in your legal judgments, but you can still disagree in your political judgments. That's a little bit more complicated. How can that be? So let's take an illustration from the moral universe of normal human beings. Let's take the case of Professor Chomsky. He says the Palestinians were ethnically cleansed in 48. That's what the historical record shows. He says, morally, ethnic cleansings are abominations. That's a no-brainer. He says, legally, the Palestinians have the right of return. Again, that's uncontroversial under international law. For those of you who doubt it, go look at the statements of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. In the year 2000 and 2001, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, they issued official statements and they said, under international law, there can't be any question, Palestinians have the right of return. So Chomsky, echoing the main human rights organization, says legally they have their right of return. But he says, Politically, I don't think it's going to happen. I don't think it's politically realistic. And so he says, in my opinion, those who tell Palestinian refugees in camps in Lebanon that they're going to return, 
when he says, you know and they know, they're not, he says, I think that's very immoral, giving people false hopes about something which is not realistic. Well, to my thinking, that's a political judgment. Political judgment is just that. It's weighing a thousand factors and then trying to decide what is and what is not politically realistic or possible. If he's right and it's not realistic and possible, then I think his conclusion reasonably follows. It becomes immoral to give people false hope. If, on the other hand, you weigh those thousand factors and you think it is possible, then obviously there's nothing immoral about trying to organize on that principle. That, to me, is a legitimate difference. It doesn't make anyone an enemy. It means people have reached different judgments weighing all the factors which can never be known with any kind of scientific precision. The only qualifications I would make to that are two. Number one, whatever our judgment on the political feasibility of the right of return, there is no dispute and no debate that legally Palestinians have the right of return under international law. And the second qualification I would make is that we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that on the bigger issue, namely the question of the two-state settlement, there is no debate, no dispute, and no contention in the international community. The right of return is more, it's a problem. And I think we should be honest about that. But most of what passes for controversy in the Israel-Palestine conflict is not controversial. It's simply fake. It's false controversy. I'll just give three typical examples and then allow for the audience to join in and we'll have a fruitful exchange. First of all, there's the claim that this conflict is so complicated that it requires the equivalent of rocket science to penetrate its mysteries. It's about a cosmic clash of religions, civilizations. It can't be compared to any other conflict. Never compare this conflict to others because it's so complicated, it's so different. The purpose of this claim is very obvious. Namely, we're told not to compare because when you make the obvious comparisons, Israel always comes out on the wrong side. So, for example, the obvious historical comparison to the Israel-Palestine conflict is what happened to the Native Americans in North America. A foreign settler population coming and displacing the indigenous population. I once sat down and made a comparison between what happened to the Palestinians and what happened to the Cherokee uh, in North America. It worked pretty well. Obviously, it wasn't perfect, but if it were perfect, it wouldn't be an analogy. What makes an analogy an analogy means there are significant aspects of the two things you're comparing which are similar. It works pretty well. Or, if you make the obvious comparison between the current situation, the occupied territories, and another conflict, the obvious comparison, as Jimmy Carter did in the title of his book, was to compare what Israel is doing in the occupied territories with 
apartheid under the South African regime. Now, when Mr. Carter made that comparison, you might recall it evoked all of this hysteria, this hue and cry. How can you compare the two? And what was kind of funny for anybody who knows the conflict is that comparison is always being made in Israel. It's not an unusual comparison at all. Bet Selim in the, uh, the Israeli Human Rights Organization, 2002, it writes, I'll read it quickly, Israel has created the occupied territories a regime of separation based on discrimination, applying two separate systems of law in the same area, basing the rights of individuals on their nationality. This regime, it says, is reminiscent is, one of, is the only one of its kind in the world, the only one, and is reminiscent of distasteful regimes from the past, such as the apartheid regime in South Africa. A more recent report, Beth Selim wrote a report on the Jews-only roads that Israel has built in the occupied territories. And then it says, this system of roads bears striking similarities to the racist apartheid regime and is even more arbitrary than the South African regime. Haaretz, Israel's main newspaper, uh, September 2006, the apartheid regime in the territories remains intact. Haaretz, October 2007, the de facto separation is today more similar to political apartheid than an occupation regime. Israel's former Attorney General, Michael Ben Yair, from 1996, he says, we enthusiastically chose to became, become a colonial society, ignoring international treaties, and on and on. And the end, he says, this is the former Attorney General, in effect, we established an apartheid regime in the occupied territories. Israel's former Minister of Education, Shulamit Aloni, the U.S. Jewish establishment's onslaught on former President Jimmy Carter is based on him daring to tell the truth, which is known to all. Through its army, the government of Israel practices a brutal form of apartheid in the territory it occupies. You're told not to compare again, so as to force you to scrupulously avoid the obvious analogies. Is the conflict so complicated? Is the roots, are the roots of the conflict so complicated? You open up Jeffrey Goldberg's book, Prisoners, and he says to understand this conflict you have to understand the Arab, the Muslim mind, because these Muslims, they envy the Jews. That's the problem. For those of you who've read your Nietzsche 101, the whole problem is resentiment, envy. So he says, it was terribly hard for Muslims to accept that their inferiors, the Jews, now ruled Palestine. This made no sense in the worldview of many Muslims who were at least sure that they were better than the Jews. That's the problem. Then there's this other grand tête. That's French, spoken by a person from Brooklyn. This fellow named Paul Berman. Who knows Paul Berman? Lucky, only one. You're, Milwaukee is insulated from civilization. You're very lucky. No, that's it's your good fortune. So he writes a book called Terrorism and Liberalism. It was very popular on the eve of the war against Iraq. And he has to explain these suicide bombers. Where do they come from, these weird people? And he says, it's all there in Albert Camus. All you have to do is read Camus and you'll understand the suicide bombers. For those of you who haven't read it, it's this book called The Rebel, 
and uh, Berman explains it this way. First, there was modernism. Then there was the will to rebel. And then there was the will to die. And that's where suicide bombers come from. So if you ever want to know why Palestinians blow themselves up, just read Camus. Okay, that's what the sophisticated uh, New Yorkers have to say. Then you take a fellow like Benny Morris. Benny Morris, you know, he's a good historian. He's a very crude, like many Israelis. He writes a good book. It's called Righteous Victims. How many people have read, read Righteous Victims? Raise your hand. That's pretty popular. Uh, it's a standard uh, college textbook. And he, too, has to explain where does this Arab Muslim enmity towards Zionism and Israel come from. But he doesn't resort to exotic theories from Nietzsche or Camus. He says, very simple, he says, the fear of territorial dispossession and displacement was to be the chief motor of Arab antagonism to Zionism. Now, many of you would think, well, what's so profound about that? But actually, it's a very interesting statement. Allow me to just repeat it. The fear of territorial dispossession and displacement was to be the chief motor of Arab antagonism to Zionism. Notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say Arab antagonism to Zionism springs from anti-Semitism. He doesn't say it springs from hatred of Jews, fear of modernity, dread of the emancipation of women. No, it's very simple. Why did Arabs oppose Zionism? because they were afraid of losing their homes, dispossession, and losing their country, displacement. It's as uncomplicated as that. And then he goes on to say, it's worth listening to. He says, in fact, their fear was perfectly rational. Let me quote him. Transfer, that means expulsion, was inevitable and inbuilt into Zionism. And this aim automatically produced resistance among the Arabs. That their fear of territorial displacement and dispossession, the fear of losing their home, was not an imaginary fear, it was a rational one. It was, to quote him, inbuilt into Zionism. It was inevitable. There's no need for exotic explanations. In fact, what's so peculiar about this conflict is that were these exotic explanations invoked in any other conflict, people would laugh. Take North America. The Native Americans resisting Euro-American encroachment. It was not a bed of roses. They killed men. They killed women. They killed children. It was very bloody. It was not for no reason that they were called savages, not that the Euro-Americans weren't also savage, but they were yesterday's terrorists. If you read the literature at the time, they weren't called Native Americans, they were just called, in the scholarly literature, they were called savages. But imagine if some historian or writer for the New Yorker of that day were to come along and say, 
that the chief motor of Native American resistance to Euro-American encroachment, the chief motor was anti-whiteism or anti-Europeanism or anti-Christianism. Well, of course, you'd laugh. You don't need exotic explanations. The chief motor of Native American resistance was the fear of territorial displacement and dispossession, just like in the case of the Palestinians in the past and the case today. The second kind of false contrived controversy is this dragging in of the Nazi Holocaust, the playing of the Holocaust card. Time doesn't allow me to go into that. Let's just say that the main contribution of what came to be, in effect, a Holocaust industry was this claim that the Nazi Holocaust was so unique and Jewish suffering was so unique that you can't compare it to any other human suffering and accordingly Jews should not be held to the same moral standards as anyone else because of the unique suffering that they endured. There's a huge literature, can fill quite a number of rooms in the library trying to prove this Holocaust uniqueness doctrine. As an intellectual doctrine, it's completely empty. And as a moral doctrine, it's a complete abomination, this notion of ranking human suffering as if there's some way to measure that a child being napalmed is suffering less than a child being thrown into a gas chamber. How do you prove it? And why would you even want to go there morally? But if it was intellectually empty, and morally an abomination, it served a very useful political purpose. Namely, it was used to justify and continues to be used to justify Israel's human rights violations on the grounds that Jews suffered uniquely. So, if Israel was the only country in the world, and it was, to legalize torture, we're told, remember the Holocaust. If Israel was the only country in the world to use house demolitions as a legal form of punishment, we're told, remember the Holocaust. If Israel was the only country in the world to legalize hostage taking, again we're told, remember the Holocaust. And just the other day, I came across another unique uh, uniqueness of Israel, not just the torture, the house demolitions, and the hostage taking, but it turns out that in July, August 2006, when Israel, Israel dropped 4.6 million, 4.6 million cluster submissions submunitions on South Lebanon. It was the densest bombardment of cluster munitions in the history of the world relative to the size of the um, uh, geographic space. There's just been nothing like it in the history of the world, including by the United States against Iraq in 1991 and then subsequently. Uh, the other novel use of the Nazi Holocaust is this claim that the Arabs were either responsible for the Nazi Holocaust, and yes, that's said, or that they are the natural uh, inheritors of the Nazis. So without going through the history too much, 1948, we were told that the Arabs were Hitler, 1967, we were told that Nasser of Egypt was Hitler. 1991, we were told Saddam Hussein was Hitler. 
2002, again we were told Saddam Hussein was Hitler. Then the past two years we're told Hamas is Hitler, Hezbollah is Hitler, Iran is Hitler, Ahmadinejad is Hitler. It's a very interesting phenomenon. On the one hand, we're told that all of Israel's enemies are Hitler incarnate, or the Nazis incarnate. On the other hand, we're told, never compare. And if you compare Hitler or the Nazis to anyone else, you're accused of Holocaust denial or Holocaust minimization. The most recent form of this Holocaust industry uh, card is the claim of a new anti-Semitism. Uh, time doesn't allow me to go into it, just a couple of brief remarks quickly. Uh, first of all, the two things to say about the new anti-Semitism are number one, it's not new, and number two, it has nothing at all to do with anti-Semitism. Every time Israel faces a public relations debacle, as it did after the second intifada, with its brutal attempts to crush the Intifada, or whenever Israel comes under a pub, uh, international pressure to resolve the conflict diplomatically, it starts with this ex extravaganza called the new anti-Semitism. That's again not speculation. It's very easy to prove. Go to your library, type in under the subject heading new anti-Semitism. 1974, the main Jewish defense organization called the Anti-Defamation League, they put out a book titled The New Anti-Semitism. 1982, the Anti-Defamation League puts out a new book titled The Real Anti-Semitism. Content, there's a new anti-Semitism. And then 2001, 2002, the hysteria started up again about a new anti-Semitism. Is there any evidence for it, this claim of a new anti-Semitism? Everybody here, or at least half the audience, they can tell for themselves. It doesn't require any great powers of research because the claim was made that the hotbed of this new anti-Semitism in North America is the college campuses, that the college campuses are rife, rampant, with this new anti-Semitism, we were told that there were pogroms, riots, being committed against Jews. I must admit, I was a little skeptical. As the person who introduced me noted, I've taught at many universities. For an academic, that's not a badge of honor. Actually, in my case, I've been around the block many times. And as of last year, I think I was around my block for the last time. Uh, but I've been on many college campuses. There are a lot of students in the audience, relatively speaking. And uh, one thing you could say about college campuses nowadays, they are so politically correct. You can't be anti-anything. You know, it has its virtues, it also has its problems. It's very stifling and suffocating, I think, in many respects to teach in a college or university nowadays. But everyone knows in a college campus, you obviously can't be anti-black, anti-Puerto Rican, anti-Hispanic, anti-woman, anti-gay, anti-anything, anti-fat, anti-skinny, anti-tall, anti-short. You know, you can't even be anti-downright ugly. You can't. So. Amidst all of this occasionally stifling and suffocating and, uh, political correctness to be told rampant anti-Semitism, riots, pogroms, or well, self-evidently, I thought, preposterous, I then proceeded to investigate it for a book I wrote couldn't find any evidence. Most of the incidents which are typically cited were simply fabricated. Now you may think, well, that's you, Finkelstein. People find what they're looking for. Fair enough. I'm not going to dispute the human propensity for self-deception and self-delusion. 
But then you open up the Chronicle of Higher Education, the main in-house magazine of boring academics, and it has an article, it's entitled, quote, it's a good time to be a Jewish student at an American college. It quotes the head of the Hillel, the main Jewish campus organization, as saying, quote, it's a golden age of Jewishness on college campuses. It quotes APAC, the main Israel lobby in the United States, as saying, it's a glorious time not only for Jewish student life on campuses, but for the pro-Israel student movement as well. And anyone who's been on college campuses, of course, knows that. You go to universities now, they have centers, programs, endowed chairs devoted to Judaic studies, Holocaust studies, Israel studies, anti-Semitism studies. The only thing they don't offer yet, and I'm sure it's coming, is a special degree in Jewish naval contemplation. How can you call this anti-Semitism rife, rife on college campuses? It's simply preposterous. Well, what about Europe? They say France, Germany, the UK, they're verging on Hitler 1938, we're told. It's Germany 1938, a new Holocaust. I looked through the literature on the topic. There have been a lot of reports written. Couldn't find any evidence of it, rather the contrary. Again, maybe that's me. So I opened up a book last summer by the leading Zionist historian in the world, a fellow by the name of Walter LeCur. And LeCur puts out a book entitled The Changing Face of Antisemitism. And what does he find? He says that referring to Europe, popular attitudes toward Jews were in fact slightly more favorable in 2002 than they had been in 1991. Not only is there no evidence of a new anti-Semitism in Europe, but in fact, the situation and status of Jews in Europe is better now than it ever has been, which is exactly what you would expect for anybody who's familiar with the European scene. Uh, the purpose of this new anti-Semitism, it's pretty straightforward, not very complicated. First of all, it turns the perpetrator, namely Israel and its apologists, into the victim. And so we're told to focus on the alleged suffering of Jews today rather than the very real suffering of Palestinians. And the second purpose of this new anti-Semitism, as everyone knows, is to discredit the critics of Israel as being motivated by anti-Semitism. And in fact, we had a very vivid example of that in the past year. So we take the case of Jimmy Carter, he puts out a book entitled Palestine, um, Peace, Not Apartheid, and Mr. Carter, immediately as the book comes out, for those of you who recall, he first, first gets accused of being, and now I'm quoting literally, he gets accused of being a plagiarist. He then was accused of being in the pay of Arab sheikhs. He was then accused of being an anti-Semite. He was then accused by Deborah Lipstadt of Emory University. He was accused of being a borderline Holocaust denier. He was then accused by Neil Schur of being a Nazi sympathizer. <clears throat> 
And then he was accused of being a supporter of Arab terrorism. Now it was very striking what happened to Jimmy Carter because it illustrates in a nutshell the whole point of my remarks this evening and that's where I'm going to leave off. Namely, notice what happened. There was this huge media hysteria surrounding Mr. Carter and he was called every name in the book and the whole discussion in the newspapers go back and read the Washington Post review read the reviews in the other periodicals the whole question became was it true is Mr. Carter an anti-Semite is he a Holocaust denier is he a Nazi sympathizer? Nobody discussed what was in the book. Don't discuss the facts. Wasn't a great book. No, it wasn't a great book. But factually, it was quite accurate. When he said the peace will come to middle, the Middle East and the Israel-Palestine, when Israel withdraws to its legal borders. That's the uncontested opinion of the world community. The uh, chapter 16, which I would recommend to everyone, it's entitled The Wall as a Prison, perfectly accurate depiction of what Israel is doing in the occupied territories, creating as it has in Gaza, the largest open air prison in the world but we're not supposed to discuss that. Let's talk about everything and anything, but don't discuss the facts. Don't discuss the documentary record. And there are basically two lessons to be learned from that. One, both of them political. Number one, our most powerful weapon is the weapon of truth and the weapon of justice. Those are the weapons that the other side dreads, that it does everything and anything possible to divert our te attention from. And we should always bear in mind that fact. Learn the record, know the record, it's our most powerful weapon, the weapons of truth and justice, basic, elementary, uncontroversial tenets of international law and morality. And the second important lesson, and it's for those of us who often feel weary, despairing, and hopeless, and believe this battle can't be won. Well, the second important lesson is what happened to Carter? They used every smear, every slander, every vicious ad hominem in the book against him. Nonetheless, to his credit, he stood his ground. He did not back off. He did not retreat. They tried damn hard to get him to retract the title about apartheid. He wouldn't do it. Well, his book was number one on the New York Times bestseller list for about three months or in the top 10, it was number one for a period. It sold an extraordinary 300,000 copies in hardback. Then Mr. Carter decided he was going to go into the belly of the beast. He said, I want to speak at Brandeis. Brandeis University is the oldest and most renowned secular Jewish inst uh, institution of higher education in the country. And he said, I want to speak there. Went to Brandeis, 
huge audience. It was in the gym. About 2,000 students showed up. And it was students, they barred the uh, community. 2,000 students, overwhelmingly Jewish, goes in. Mr. Carter gets four standing ovations from the overwhelmingly Jewish student body. When Mr. Dershowitz is invited to respond to him, it's said or was reported about two-thirds of the overwhelmingly Jewish body at the oldest secular Jewish university in the U.S., about two-thirds walked out on Professor Dershowitz. And that, I think, tells us there is an audience out there that's ready to listen, ready to hear, if we arm ourselves with the facts, not with slanders, but also not with slogans and not with exaggerations, and I would also have to say not with unreasonable positions. Now is not the time to strike radical poses. Now is the time to stick to the facts be reasonable and take a little bit of political wisdom from somebody who, maybe I was wrong, probably I was wrong, I don't know. In the 1960s, there was this fellow way, way, way long ago. None of you have ever heard of him. His name was Mao Zedong. Who's heard of Mao Zedong? Anyone? Oh, a few people. He was the head of China. We used to call him back then Chairman Mao. And one of Chairman Mao's famous slogans was, unite the many to defeat the few. And that always struck me as being a, 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 a prudent political strategy. Don't alienate. Don't try to be more radical than thou. Stick to the facts. Be reasonable. Don't exaggerate. Don't indulge in sloganeering, and I think we still have a reasonable chance. You can't predict with certainty, but we have a reasonable chance if we hold high uh, the principles of truth and justice, and like Mr. Carter, not to retreat. Hold fast to those principles. I still think those of us who are struggling for a just and lasting peace of the Israel-Palestine conflict, I think we can win. Thank you. I always prefer, after people have heard me at an unendurable length, uh, to let the centers go first, since the audience was remarkably respectful uh, of me. Uh, if you have a dissenting question, maybe you can uh, line up first. Do you have a dissenting question? No. Would you? Okay. I, my question isn't necessarily dissenting, it's how you interpret it. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that the uh, conquest of territory by war is inadmissible according to the Geneva agenda. Not the Geneva. The, the uh, international law. Yeah. Uh, Jordan took over the West Bank. Egypt took over Gaza. Mm -hmm. uh, the indigenous Palestinian Arabs had no state at that time. Uh, those lines of 1967 reflect that those are armistice lines at the end of the War of Independence. They're not borders. And uh, why isn't uh, the territory that Jordan conquered uh, inadmissible also 
as a, uh, according to international law. Okay, the question that's asked is, for those of you who aren't familiar with the background, in 1947, as I said, the United Nations passes the partition resolution uh, stipulating an, a Jewish state and an Arab state in what's called British Mandate Palestine. By the end of the war, part of the territory which was designated for the Palestinian state was absorbed by Israel, and part of the territory that was designated for the Palestinian state was absorbed by Jordan, and part of it was absorbed by Egypt. And the question that was put to me is, uh, why, was, why wasn't that illegitimate? Well, as a matter of fact, it was illegitimate. The Jordanian absorption of the West Bank was only recognized by two countries in the world, Great Britain and Pakistan. And Egypt never uh, annexed the West uh, uh, Gaza. It, was, it's, it had um, uh, territorial jurisdiction over it, but never annexed the Gaza. Now, if you want to question those borders, and you want to call them armistice lines, uh, as you put it, the 1949 borders, then bear in mind what you're saying. Because as you well know, you're apparently versed in the history, as you well know, Israel was allotted 56% of Palestine. By the end of the war in 49, it had 80% of Palestine. So there is one exception in the world we have one exception, where acquisition of territory by war has been accepted by the international community. Do you know what the one exception is? The exception is Israel's annexation of that land, which was not designated for a Jewish state in 1948. Now, if you want to reject those armistice borders, then you have to then be open to the prospect of Israel going back to 56% of Palestine. Do you want that? <clears throat> I didn't hear any Israeli supporting that. So you, is, those who support Israel should be very cautious about questioning those armistice borders of 49, because that means Israel may actually get less. Mm -hmm. Yes? You noted that in many of the uh, votes in the United Nations that uh, Israel and the other major countries, the mm -hmm. United States, mm -hmm. uh, takes the reject rejectionist view. Mm -hmm. I, given that, would, would you comment on the article by Mearsheimer and Walt and uh, the role that uh, APAC plays in all of this uh, issue? What's your take on that? Okay, uh, the question that's asked to me is the following. I, try, I want to try to bring everybody into the discussion because sometimes there are references to things you may not be familiar with in specific, but you know the issue in general. Uh, there are two professors, one named John Mearsheimer from the University of Chicago and another named Stephen Walt from the Harvard Kennedy School, and they wrote what became a notorious or famous article uh, in which they argued about the Israel lobby having too much power in the United States uh, and blaming the Israel lobby not only for U.S. policy in the occupied territories, but blaming the Israel lobby for the U.S. war against Iraq. And the question that's being asked of me is, what's my opinion? I have to always preface my opinion by saying that John Mearsheimer was extremely supportive of me during the, uh, my difficulties last year at my university, and so I have to always acknowledge his generosity and uh, be clear that there's no personal animus or a political animus. Uh, there is just a question of a difference of opinion. Uh, the record, in my opinion, shows that when you stick to the narrow question of the Israel-Palestine conflict, it's probably true that it's the Israel lobby which accounts for U.S. policy. Because in the moment's reflection, you ask yourself, what does the U.S. stand to gain from Israel's occupation of the West Bank? 
What does it stand to gain from the settlements? What does it stand to gain from the colonial expansion? The answer obviously is zero. And since there are no fundamental U.S. interests at stake, I think the answer is it's the Israel lobby which shapes U.S. policy when it comes to the Israel-Palestine conflict. However, when you get into the broader issue of the whole Middle East, Iraq, Iran, Saudi Arabia, where fundamental U.S. interests are at stake, the claim that Israel is determining those interests, in my opinion, it's not only not tenable at a theoretical level, there is zero, precisely zero, evidence at a factual level for that claim. So let's just quickly take the case of Iraq. I know it's a little bit of a digression, but people are interested on the question of Iraq and the role of the Israel lobby. So let's look at it very briefly. Anyone who studied or familiar, and everyone in this room is, uh, with the uh, process leading up to the war in Iraq, there is no dispute whatsoever that the main architects of the war were Cheney and Rumsfeld. Is there any disagreement in this room? You know, Bush, okay, he was in his room with his PlayStation 3. <laughs> he's, not a, he's not a real factor. But Rumsfeld and Cheney, they're the main architects of the war. About that, there's no serious dispute in the scholarly literature that's available. Well, say what you want about Rumsfeld and Cheney, but members of the Israel lobby, they plainly are not. And Rumsfeld and Cheney, I think it's fairly obvious that when they make calculations, they're calculating on what's good for the U.S. national interest as they interpret it. But is there anyone in this room who seriously believes Mr. Rumsfeld and Mr. Cheney, when they made their calculations in the build-up to the war in Iraq, were putting Israel's interests first? Does that sound like Mr. Cheney and Mr. Rumsfeld? So how does Walt and Mayor Scheimer try to finesse this obvious problem? They say, well, those people second in line, Libby, Fife, Wolfowitz, that they tricked Rumsfeld and Cheney. And Libby, Fife, Wolfowitz, Shulsky, and they name all the Jews that they had been working for Israel and they deceived Mr. Cheney and Mr. Rumsfeld. Now again, I ask you a simple question. You don't have to have a doctorate from an elite university to answer these questions. There are many things you could say about Mr. Cheney. Murderer, thug, I'll go there with you. But gullible? No. Mr. Cheney, for better or for worse, is a very shrewd, smart man. He is not going to be tricked by Mr. Libby or Mr. Fife. And then Mr. Walheimer and um, uh, uh, Mersheimer and Walt, they say that these uh, agents of Israel, Fife, Libby, Wolfowitz, and the rest, they say they were obviously agents of Israel because Mearsheimer and Walt say, look at the policies they're advocating. These, ob these policies obviously serve Israel's national interest and not the American national interest. So now you're stuck with another problem. Wolfowitz, Feith, Libby, they've been working with Cheney and Rumsfeld for 30 years. Mr. Wolfowitz worked right under Cheney in 1980 in the Reagan administration. They know each other intimately. 
They know their politics, their allegiances. It's a 30-year relationship. Does it make any sense to anyone in this room that Mr. Cheney and Mr. Rumsfeld are going to staff all the most strategic positions in the Defense Department and in the Vice President's office with open agents of a foreign government? Is that plausible? Is that credible? Is that believable? The moment you strip away, with no animus intended, but you strip away the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of footnotes in the book version of their article, which I've read several times, and you just look at the stark argument, the stark thesis, it just makes no sense. It's not believable. Unless you want to believe that Cheney and Rumsfeld were also secret agents of Israel. And then you enter into a realm of fantasy and paranoia. I just can't go there. You know, that's, you know, Spitzer being framed by Israel territory. I, I can't go there. Yes. Next question. Um, you obviously enjoying what you're doing, and um, you establish um, uh, various sources that uh, you build uh, support for. And was going to attack Israel. How do we know that? It's very easy to check. You shouldn't take my word. I agree with you. You know. I'm from the 1960s. I like the, the button we used to wear, question authority. And you shouldn't take my word for it. Let's see what the record shows. You're going to have to allow me to finish. I want to go through the record for the audience quickly. The Straits of Tyrone. Okay, allow, allow, me, allow me to finish. No, he could stand. I, I, there's no antagonism. We're just going to try to find the truth. Number one. In June 1st of 1967, Meyer Amit, he was the head of Israel's Mossad at the time. Uh, Meyer Amit, he comes to Washington and he discusses what's happening with the Israel conf Israeli conflict with Egypt. The United States had about six different intelligence agencies looking into what will Nasser do? And the Israelis keep coming to Washington and they keep checking with their intelligence agencies. March 25th, March 26th, and you can read the whole record. Each time Johnson, President Johnson, he asks them, the intelligence agencies, well, what's Egypt going to do? And the intelligence agencies come back and say, he's not going to attack. And then they say, and even if on the remote possibility that he does attack, Johnson says, quote, our intelligence, if on the remote possibility that he does attack, Johnson says, quote, our intelligence agencies show you will, and I'm quoting Johnson, whip the hell out of them. There are only, on those two questions, will Egypt attack? The answer is no. And if it does attack, what will happen? Our intelligence agency said, even if all the countries attack simultaneously, and even if they start hostilities, you'll win to quote at that time Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, you'll win in seven to ten days. Meyer Amit comes to Washington. When he discusses this, he says, quote, all of your estimates and predictions are the same as ours. <laughs> 
There is no disagreement between the Israelis and the Americans that Nasser is not going to attack. Under international law, number one, there wasn't even a case here of a preemptive attack because Egypt wasn't going to attack. You're not preempting anything. And the closest argument you can make is an argument as we made in the case of Iraq for what's called a preventive war. And at some point down the line he may attack, so we should prevent it. But that's illegal under international law. Preventive wars are illegal. The second question that was put to me was, well, if it were a defensive war, what does the law show? The law is clear. Look at the first statement of UN Resolution 242. It says, quote, emphasizing the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. Emphasizing the inadmissibility of the acquisition of territory by war. Notice it doesn't say aggression. Namely, it doesn't say you're not allowed to acquire territory in a war of aggression if the war is a defensive war or an aggressive war, it's immaterial. In the international law, as it's uh, from the, flowing from the UN Charter, regardless of whether it's offensive or defensive, you can't acquire territory by war. And so my answer is, even if it were a defensive war, which it wasn't, Israel would still have no title to those territories. It's not my opinion, it's the law. Now you're asking me, you used an expression at the very beginning. You said, the sources I use, as if my sources are suspect. But what were the sources? Is the International Court of Justice a suspect source? It was the court that said it's inadmissible to acquire territory by war, quoting UN Resolution 242. It was all 15 justices who said it's illegal. That's not me, that's the law. Can I add just one sentence? Sure. The start of the 67 war occurred on May 22nd with the act of war by, by Egypt in the, the blockade of the Straits of Tehran. Well, that would be an interesting fact were it true. <laughs> if, you look at article, if you look at Article 51 of the United Nations Charter, it says you're allowed to use you're allowed to act in self-defense. Look at the words. It says against an armed attack. Armed attack. Even if it were true, and it's not, time doesn't allow me to go through it, it's not. But even if it were true that there was a blockade in the Straits of Tehran, that's not grounds for war under international law. It was not an armed attack. That's why there was talk about Israel sending a vessel through the Straits of Tehran, hoping Nasser would fire on it, and then they would have the pretext, because it would be an armed attack. But a blockade under international law it's just not true. Most of what, regrettably, most of what we know about the conflict is simply distilled through Israeli propaganda. I have gone through that record very closely, very closely. Immediately after the war, 
there was a meeting of the United Nations General Assembly, the fifth emergency session of the United Nations General Assembly. Now, this is literally true. There was not one country in the world, not one, which said that Israel acted in self-defense in June 67. The position of the United States, Arthur Goldberg, I was our U.S. ambassador at the time, the position of the United States was both sides were responsible for the escalation of hostilities. There was no country in the world that went on record apart from Israel as saying it acted in self-defense in June 1967. That's just a mythology that was created by a very efficient propaganda machine, the same one that had people believing for 40 years that the Palestinians fled due to Arab orders in 1948. There is no evidence for this. Um, hello. Um, I hope you bear with me. I want to read what I want to ask you and what I sure. want to say. Um, my name is Rick. Um, I've recently created, last week as a matter of fact, a new Zionism awareness blog at www.zionism.blogspot.com if you want to take a look at it. Uh, Professor Finkelstein, I have two questions for you with a brief review of a question I posed to you a year or so ago when you appeared at the University of Marquette. Um, at that time, I asked you whether Americans needed to be educated on what Zionism is. I define Zionism as Jewish apartheid, Jewish exceptionalism. Your response was no, that the concept of Zionism had already received enough exposure. Perhaps that is the case in your immediate circles, but if you go to uh, any shopping mall around here, with the exception of Bayshore maybe, and you ask anyone uh, about Zionism, you'll find virtually everyone you ask doesn't have a clue what it is, they've never heard of it. Um, it could be a new flavor of ice cream, for all they know. So my, new que my two questions. Why do you suppose that here in America we hear from our media so much about Islamofascism and radical Islam, but we hear absolutely nothing about Zionism, Jewish apartheid? Question two. You are, you are to be commanded for raising your voice about the injustices imposed on Palestinians. It's courageous of you doing that. How is it that oh so many justice activist Jews are able to see the injustices imposed upon the Palestinians for the sake of Zionism, but still, still seem to believe that Zionism, Jewish apartheid, can, can be had nicely. That somehow there can be Zionism, Jewish apartheid in the Middle East, without war and conflict. Well, my answer hasn't really changed from last year or a year and a half ago. I, don't, I said at the end of my remarks, I see no point whatsoever in engaging in sloganeering or using a terminology that's going to alienate people. Why can't we use simple terms and concepts which everybody understands and which distill the essence of the conflict? I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Zionism, so I have some sort of stake in it. Uh, but I never bring it up in these kinds of meetings because I don't see the necessity of doing so. Why can't we use a simple language about human rights, international law, which everybody does understand, and then try to create a consensus on resolving the conflict, rather than dragging in a language which is only going to cause new digressions, create unnecessary enemies, demand different kinds of litmus tests and oaths of loyalty, which are only distractions from trying to resolve this conflict. What does it even mean to be a Zionist? I asked Professor Chomsky, he says, I've been a Zionist since I'm six years old, and I haven't changed at all. Oh, you know, I thought to myself when he said that, my goodness, at six years old I was just learning how to tie my shoes and zip my zipper, and he's already a Zionist at six years old, and he's already figured it all out.
But whether he is or he isn't, is it really important for trying to reach consensual principles for resolving the conflict? Does that make him an enemy? Because in his view, his understanding of Zionism, he's a Zionist. I just think th these are things which unnecessarily divide us. And we really have, to, in my opinion, s stay away from it. Just quote the human rights reports. Quote the international court. Quote what Israeli historians and good American and British historians say in the subject. And not try to create divisions when they're just not necessary. Um, with all due respect, I assume that, again, with your last name, you are Jewish. Mm -hmm. If, in fact, Israel is such a despicable, horrific country mm -hmm. as you make it out to be, then where, in fact, would you place a Jewish nation? Well, if I were to, um, if I were to give a lecture on the United States, uh, I don't think the picture I would portray would be particularly flattering to what the United States does around the world. Uh, I was asked here... Uh, I was asked here to speak on the Israel-Palestine conflict. And although I'm painfully aware that what the United States does in the world in any single day is probably many times worse than Israel has been able to do in the whole history of the conflict, it doesn't mean I want to displace the American nation. I think I start out by saying, you know, given Barack Obama's current candidacy and the fact that it's viable, kind of makes me feel proud in some respect, like Barack Obama's wife said, to be an American. Uh, but I don't see any virtue when people are suffering to wave the flag. I don't find that particularly admirable. And I don't think it's particularly admirable to try to drag in extraneous and phony issues in order to deflect attention from what Israel is doing. Is there a single statement, a single word, a single punctuation mark of mine which anyway implied that I thought that Israel didn't have a right to be there? I think what I said was, from, my ver from the get-go, when I went to the... Uh, International Court of Justice statement on the topic, I said that the basic principles are that the Palestinians have the right to self-determination and statehood in the whole of the occupied territories. And I said there was a second principle of international law, Article 2. Every state, member state of the United Nations has the right to be free from threats or use of force. And I think I said under that principle, the neighboring Arab states and the future Palestinian state have to recognize Israel's right under Article 2. Now, why do you drag in, where do I want to put the Jewish nation? That's exactly what I'm talking about this evening. You drag in totally extraneous issues in order to deflect attention from the factual record. And the factual record is, for 40 years, Palestinians have, have had to endure a brutal occupation. And I think that's where our attention should be fixed. <clears throat> yeah. um, how has the immigration of non-European Jews of color played a role in the Israel-Palestine conflict? If you mean the question of the uh, roughly 60% of the Israeli uh, population, of the Jewish population, which is uh, from the Arab regimes. I'm not sure how that changes anything fundamental. I'm not sure how that factors into the issues of law and morality. Maybe if you want to clarify what you think I'm missing. You want to go back to... How did their the way they were brought in, how, mm -hmm. how their immigration went about, how did that affect mm -hmm. anything? Cause that yeah. plays you in. know, there are issues that have been raised about how did the um, Arab, the Jews from the Arab world mm -hmm. come to Israel and why they were expelled from the Arab countries. There's not much scholarship been written on it, but the evidence seems to show the main places from where the Jews came, namely Morocco, Iraq, Yemen, mm 
uh, there's no evidence that there was an expulsion. The case of Morocco is clearly not the case. If you read people like Avi Shleim, the Israeli historian at Oxford, who is an Iraqi Jew who left in 48, you know, he did a recent uh, interview on the topic in the Israeli newspaper, and he said, well, you know, it's clear the, the Iraqi Jews were not expelled. It's just not true. Uh, the Yemeni Jews, it's clearly they weren't expelled. Um, but uh, as I said, the, the, there's not much scholarship written on the topic, so I can't speak with any great authority on it. So you're saying that they weren't expelled at all? Well, no, I said that the main uh, areas are Iraq, um, Morocco, Yemen, uh, and in those cases there's no evidence of an expulsion. What about Ethiopia? Well, Ethiopia is the Falasha Jews, but that's much, much later. We're not talking about 48. Okay. The, uh, what was called Operation Exodus or Wings or whatever. Uh, that came, what, in the 1980s, I think. It was several thousand. There was no question of expulsion. It was a famine going on. And Israel decided, quote, unquote, to rescue the Falasha Jews. Sorry, I came in late, so bear with me if you already answered my questions. Mm -hmm. um, are there any pointers of credible sources on uh, the role of Stern gangs in 1948? Um, mm -hmm. And what happened to them after that, after 1948? Did they just assimilate into the uh, civil society as citizens, or were they the seat of the IDF? Mm -hmm. um, what happened to them? No. You know, there were what were called, uh, at the time, right-wing Zionist uh, groups like what were called the uh, Stern Gang, the Ergun. They didn't play a major role in the 1948 war. Uh, I'm not so sure if it's all that important to differentiate them from uh, the rest of uh, the Israeli society. They had real political differences, but the real political differences were not really on the issues which turned out to be formative for the conflict. So, for example, I quote to you earlier Benny Morris, who said that the idea of transfer, expulsion, it was inbuilt in the Zionist idea. It wasn't right-wing Zionist versus labor Zionist, uh, Ben-Gurion versus ben Begin or Ben-Gurion versus Jabotinsky. On the fundamental issue, they didn't really disagree. You want to create a Jewish state in an area that's overwhelmingly non-Jewish, the only way you can do it is by getting rid of the native population. That's, you know, that's why it was, as uh, Mara said, inevitable and inbuilt in the Zionist idea. And Morris makes the point, however you cut up the map of Palestine, there was always a large uh, Arab presence in any Jewish state. Some of you may know in 1937, 38, there was this British uh, uh, in, a committee of, a commission of inquiry called Appeal Commission. And they were going to make a small Jewish state, not 56% uh, of Palestine, a tiny port fragment of Palestine, uh, maybe 30% or even less if my memory is right. And even in the 30%, they said 225,000 Arabs will have to be expelled. There was just no way you can cut up this map without having a large Arab presence. And then there was the other problem. Where are you going to put the Jews? The land is owned by the Arabs. The only way you can find place for the Jews is to expropriate the indigenous population. These aren't theoretical questions. They're not matters of theory. It's not like if the Zionists had decided to create a state in some South Sea island which was uninhabited, no problem would have arisen and expulsion being inbuilt and inevitable would never have arisen. But you're trying to create a state which, on the eve of Zionist colonization, was 95% Muslim and Christian Arab. And the only way you can create an overwhelmingly Jewish state in an area which is overwhelmingly non-Jewish is by getting rid of the indigenous population. It was a practical problem. Doctor, you had submitted some, um, what you submitted, manufactured rationale uh, for the use of aggressive policy 
uh, in the state of Israel. Um, assuming rationality on part of Israel, what, do you, what would you say would be your understanding of the real rationale and vision and ultimate goal of the state? Um, you know, there, there are always these questions that arise. Why does Israel stay in the occupied territories? It obviously has nothing whatever to do with security. That's just a complete mythology. What's the reason? And then there are basically three possibilities. One is the ideological one. There are Zionists, this is designated for the Jewish state, and we're not retreating. And there's an element in Israel who's obviously ideologically committed. Uh, and then there was what used to be called the rational argument. Namely, they wanted the good land and they wanted the water. Uh, and that was the rationale. Uh, I don't think that carries that much weight now, though the water is a problem, no question about it. Uh, my own view is, for what it's worth, uh, I think may, their main motive is political that the Israelis have always had it in their minds that their standard, their fixed, um, uh, their fixed assumption is Arabs only understand the language of force. And every once in a while these Arabs have to get a club banged over their head to show them who's in charge. And so since we're there, we're not leaving if they want us to leave because they have to realize we're in charge. It was the same thing in Lebanon. Why did they stay until May 2000? Originally people said they wanted the water of the Latani and so on and so forth, but it really wasn't true. They didn't leave because the resistance wanted them to leave and they didn't want to show weakness. You never concede because then they're afraid the Arabs will get it into their minds. If we defeat them once, we'll defeat them again. And so they have to be steadfast. And so it becomes a kind of, you know, irrationality. You're staying because they want you to leave. So I don't really think they have any big stakes in the West Bank. The security is you know, plainly preposterous. Uh, and the water and the land, yeah, they want the water and the land, sure. But it's not life and death. I think it's the same thing as in Lebanon. They don't want to leave because they want to show who's in charge. And it doesn't really make them. I know it doesn't sound like a particularly convincing argument, but a lot, of time, a lot of times politics is like that. You sometimes look for deep-seed explanations and they just aren't there. People ask, why did we go into Iraq? And they look for deep explanations having to do with oil, geopolitics, and so forth. If you look at the actual record, I don't think it really was that profound because um, they thought, the people in charge in the U.S., they thought it was going to be an easy war. They thought it would be a rollover. They knew Iraq was a rickety machine ready to collapse. And so, as one person put it, I thought the most insightful statement I've read, and I've read all the books on the topic, um, the Washington Post reporter, Thomas, I can't remember his name, uh, in any case, he says, the United States invade Iraq as if it were a banana republic. And I think that's exactly right. They thought it was going to be an easy win. It would help them out in electoral, you know, the next election. Uh, it would probably keep the Republicans in power for several successive administrations. And I don't think it was particularly complicated because we think it's complicated because we look at it retrospectively and it turned into a big mess. But they thought it was going to kind of be like Panama. You go in, we went into Panama, killed 3,000 people, take this guy, uh, uh, Noriega. 
no, 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 no. After Noriega, uh, I forgot the guy's name. A, a very plump man. What was his name? Andara. What? And Dara, and they inaugurated him on an aircraft carrier and put him into office, and they figured they would do the same thing with Chalabi, and they figured it would be open, over in a couple of weeks. Um, I don't think there was a profound explanation of Iraq, and I don't think there are particularly profound explanations in the case of uh, uh, Israel. What happened, you know, 2,000 are forced to withdraw, and what's the first thing they do when they're forced to withdraw from Lebanon? They start planning the next war. Because you've got to teach these Arabs a lesson. You do not win. And then in July 2006, they find a new pretext to go in and try to knock out Hezbollah. It didn't work. Uh, but that's their mentality. Arabs only understand the language of force and everyone once in a while you have to take out the big club and break their skulls. Yeah. In behalf of myself, I thank you, thank you very much. And I think many here also thank you very much for your ideas that advocate equal rights for Palestinian and Jew. And I wish you kindly to explain the audience why the Israeli attacked the Navy ship Liberty. Also, America is the staunchest defender of Israel. Thank you very much. The question is, in 1967, at the very end of the war, uh, Israel attacked uh, an American intelligence ship, spy ship, if you want to call it, named Liberty, killed uh, I guess about 50 uh, American uh, naval personnel it was the biggest loss of American naval personnel in peacetime in U.S. history. And he asked me to explain why. And the truth of the matter is, to this state, nobody knows why. There's never been a satisfactory ac uh, explanation put forth. However, uh, I have no reason whatsoever to doubt that that was an intentional, deliberate attack on the liberty, uh, and those people were killed for no good reason. I've, been, I've read everything there is to read on the topic, and I've been in touch with the person who's written the most on the topic, uh, Mr. Ennis. Uh, I think what he says is perfectly credible. There was, for those of you who don't know the facts, it is simply indisputable there was a huge American flag on that ship. You couldn't possibly have not seen it. The Israelis had several overflights over the Liberty before they came in for an attack. At some point, even Ennis said, we waved to the um, pilots in the plane. Uh, honest people, I do not think, can doubt. There have been all of these weird explanations trying to pretend there was a rational explanation. My favorite is Michael Oren in his book on the June 67 war. He said, you have to understand the pilots were looking for submarines. That's why they didn't see the flag. <laughs> no. If you are looking from the sky to see what's underneath the water, you will see what's above the water. <laughs> I don't find that very believable. That's literally what he wrote. <laughs> it's funny. That's called scholarship. <laughs> he's very important. He's a great thinker. He's yeah, at Yale, um, or he was at Yale just last year. Very smart uh, man. I don't. I I don't disagree with uh, what most of you said, uh, uh, but there is. Um, this is one of our text, one of our textbooks uh, in International Studies 370, and uh, I just want to read mm -hmm. a little something from it. <clears throat> I quote: President Sadat in, initiated the war against I uh, Israel in 1973 with a clear political goal. F pure, from a pure milita uh, purely military standpoint, the war appeared to go badly for Egypt with Israeli troops ending in position of territory on both banks of the Suez Canal. 
Yet diplomacy and military pressure of the following years did lead to a peace settlement. It basically goes on to say that the reason why Sadat started the war was to regain the Suez Canal and uh, and the Sinai, and that he he also says that basically you're you you were, he agrees with you on with Lebanon, but not with the 56, 67, and 73 wars. Uh, the writers David W. Ziegler. Mm -hmm. I I just want. Well, that's that's fine. On that. Fine. I, I'm happy to comment on it. So, what does the record show? As you know, in June 1967, Israel conquers not just the West Bank and Gaza, uh, but it also conquers the Golan Heights and the Egyptian Sinai. And those are also territories acquired by war. In February 1971, President Sadat. Uh, just to give you a quick background, I know I'm exhausting your patience, but I want to give a full answer. Uh, after the June 67 mission, excuse me, war, and UN Resolution 242, a special mediator is appointed by the United Nations to try to resolve this conflict. And this mediator is a fellow named Gunnar Yaring from Sweden. And Gunnar Yaring goes to the Egyptians, the Israelis, the Egyptians, the Israelis, okay. How do you want to solve this conflict? And the Egyptians say, we want our territory back. And the Israelis say, we want Israel, we want Egypt to recognize us. Uh, Egypt says, uh, we'll deposit a document in the UN saying we recognize Israel, but we're not going to have any formal recognition. No treaty. Israel says, okay, and we're not leaving. But then in February 1971, Sadat so says, okay, we will sign a treaty with Israel if Israel withdraws from the Sinai. And Yaring says, okay, now we have some movement, and he goes to the Israelis. And he says, Sadat has now agreed to your terms. It will sign a separate formal treaty with you. And what do you say? And the famous answer of the Israeli cabinet in February 1971 was, quote, we will not return to the June 4, 1967 borders. Well, at that point, Sadat says, uh, then we're going to go to war. The Israelis say, ah, these Arabs, they don't know about war. Look what happened in June 67. These Arabs, they don't know how to fight wars. The famous nickname that the Israelis gave to the Arabs, they called them, uh, literally, they called them monkeys. That's how they thought, or what they thought of Arabs. 1971, 1972, Sadat says, uh, we're going to go to war. Israelis say, it's never going to go to war. Then Utant, he's the Secretary General of the United Nations, and Utan says, look, if you don't withdraw from those territories in exchange for a peace treaty, then you're courting a war. So they say it's never going to happen. And well, in fact, that was probably the most publicly broadcast war in the history of the world. For two years, Sadat said, that's what we're going to do. And in October 1973, he did it. Now, bear in mind, bear in mind, not one country in the world, not one, including the U.S., Kissinger said it. I did not condemn um, Egypt for aggression. Why? because he has the right to recover his territory. He never attacked Israel. All he did was move troops from the West Bank to the East Bank of the Suez Canal. That's not Israel. That's the Sinai Peninsula. That's called Egyptian territory. There was no attack on the state of Israel. And so nobody in the world ever conceived that as a war of aggression, leaving aside the fact 
that Egypt had the right to do what it had to do in order to get its sovereign territory back, which Israel said it was not going to do. At that point, the older people in the room will remember Israel was building the settlements in the northeast Sinai and was saying that it intended to keep one-third of the Sinai, and it got a war. Thank you for being here. You're always uh, wonderful to listen to. The question that I have is um, there have been uh, a number of political writers that have said that if Israel continues with the policies that they have now, that there won't be a two-state solution, that they will eventually have to deal with a one-state solution. Um, this is obviously something that 40 years ago really wasn't talked about, um, but it's more and more becoming um, a common theme. I just wanted to get your opinion on that. You know, we're, we're plainly heading towards trouble. Uh, I don't think it's just the question of the West Bank and Gaza. Uh, the, the, the level of the conflict is rising. Whenever you think about Hezbollah, they're serious. It's serious business. The last time they directed missiles at Haifa, in the next war, and the next war is inevitable. Israel will never accept the defeat it suffered in July 2006. The next war, it's almost certain they're going to direct uh, missiles at Tel Aviv. What the Israeli retaliation is going to be, I think it's going to be pretty terrible. Uh, and the stakes are getting higher and higher. Uh, if Israel does, you know, go after Iran, uh, it's going to be a very big problem. And that's why I think, you know, you're a, what you call a supporter of Israel. I've never known what that term means, but you call yourself a supporter of Israel. And I think we all have a common agenda. You want to see Israel destroyed? No? Okay. The stakes are getting very high. So we have a common agenda to resolve the conflict. And what are the only principles out there in which everyone agrees on? Well, it's those principles I expressed earlier this evening, quoting the international community. So I think that whatever comes of the Israel-Palestine dimension of the conflict, and I, it's becoming a complicated uh, in that respect, the one you point to. The whole regional conflict is becoming very messy because uh, Hezbollah is serious business. Uh, uh, I think we all have a stake in just trying to end the conflict on reasonable terms, which you know, are the closest you're going to get to justice under current conditions, I think. Uh, and we should all work towards that because um, I think things are getting really, they're, they're getting seriously dangerous now. I don't think there's any possibility Israel is going to accept that defeat. It's a second defeat, the one in May 2000 and then the July, August 2006. And I don't think there's any possibility that Hezbollah is going to allow itself to be treated like fish in a barrel. There will be a, a serious retaliation. There's going to be a serious retaliation for that last assassination by Israel. I don't know when it's going to come, but it will come. When they say they will, they will. Whether you like it or not, they are people of their word, and they're not impulsive. They are extremely patient. They're smart, they're serious, and they're patient. There will be a retaliation. I wouldn't be surprised if they managed to assassinate Barack. I think that may happen, uh, because they will not take it sitting down. Uh, I can see their point. The, pal the, uh, the Arabs are tired of being treated like a free fire range for Israel. And these people are going to ask for that Old Testament justice. And frankly, you know, maybe people don't like to hear it, but I can understand that. Uh, and so trouble is brewing. There will be a retaliation, 
maybe the Israelis are waiting for the retaliation in order to use it as the pretext for going in for that inevitable round three. And that's why Hezbollah is holding off now until it's ready. And then there will be that retaliation for the assassination. And it's getting uglier and uglier and more dangerous and more dangerous. And so we really, you know, you don't want to see that happen. I don't want to see it happen. And we all have to work hard to avert it from happening uh, because things are headed in a very dangerous direction now. On that point, uh, mm -hmm. just hypothetically going forward, say that there is a two-state solution or a one-state solution. Mm -hmm. Say that some kind of equilibrium democratically uh, is realized between the Palestinians and the Jews, so, uh, the Israelis, rather. Um, I think this takes place, and the, and the, the biggest fear, it seems to me, for even moderate Israelis is the fact that the, the population disparity, and if there was an equal vote for each person, that they would simply be marginalized, and any kind of mm -hmm. uh, retribution they've invoked uh, fairly or unfairly would be visited upon them. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really the main, the, the, the thing, the, the devil's in the details. Because mm -hmm. so could, you, could you speak, you say, work, let's work towards a solution, let's work towards that. But could you speak towards what that, I know it probably could take a whole other session, but what that picture might look like mm -hmm. uh, of some kind of peaceful stasis, even though it won't be stasis, it'll be a process. Well, there are two separate issues. There's a sort of a theory, a, a abstract issue, and there's a practical issue. You know, uh, you're old enough uh, to remember the American South. And the American South, they dreaded desegregation, and they dreaded giving African Americans uh, the right to vote because they said it's going to uh, wreck the southern way of life. If these people can now go to the same, live with us, and so on and so forth, there's this thing they called the Z southern way of life. And giving African Americans the right to vote and integration and so forth, it's going to destroy it. Now, there was an argument there. There was a southern way of life, and that southern way of life was premised on segregation. That's true. Is that grounds, then, to deny African Americans the right to vote and to deny integration? In the case of South Africa, there wasn't only the theoretical possibility of them being whites being swamped in an election, it was a factual reality. It wasn't a prospect, it was a factual reality. Blacks are 78% of the population, whites about 22, something like that. No, I think it was 87, 13 actually, I don't remember now. Um, and they thought these black people are savages and to give them the right to vote is gonna to totally destroy that white way of life in South Africa. Was that grounds to deny black people the right to vote and to create a system based on you know, one person, one vote, and all the rest? It, was it grounds? And so if your answer is it wasn't grounds in the American South and it wasn't grounds in South Africa, I don't see how you can make a special exception for Israel-Palestine. Having said that, it's not yet a practical issue because the settlement that's being called for now is a two-state settlement. It's not a one-state settlement where that issue arises. There is an issue that does arise, which is that 20% of the Israeli population is Arab, and it's growing at a faster rate, you know, obviously, than the Israeli Jewish population. There is a problem arising there. I don't see how you can, you know, um, accept these basic principles in one place and not another. You're going to have to learn to live with these people, just like American uh, people in the South had to learn to live with black people and they had to live with, learn to live with black people in South Africa. I don't see another...
uh, I can't see another position which is justifiable. Uh, and I just have to say, I know maybe you don't really want to hear it, but uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the occupied territories. I've lived in, uh, in you know, the heart dead of the Muslim occupied territories, not Gaza, but I lived in Hebron. Uh, and I lived in Fawar camp. Uh, I don't see any problem with living with Palestinian Arabs. I liked it there. You know, and my closest friend, uh, Musa Abu Heshesh, uh, we're very close friends. Uh, I don't dread those prospects. I'm not so afraid of them. I don't think rational people should be afraid of them. It's like Americans, you know, New York City. It's one of the funniest things about New York. Ask New Yorkers who are white, and whenever they hear Harlem, it's like, oh my God. 98% of white New Yorkers have never been to Harlem. It just has that kind of mystique. But then European whites, when they come over, where do they all live? Whenever you meet a European, you know, 20 or 30 year old, where do you live? Harlem. Why? So you all love Harlem. As a New Yorker, you develop this kind of you know, psychosis and paranoia about it. And foreigners never have a problem. And the same thing there. You talk to Israelis, you were in Hebron? Or I remember during the first Intifada, you were in Arab Jerusalem? It's like, you know, you were on Mars. And whereas if you were Jewish and you were reasonable, there was never any problem at all. The only thing I ever feared in the occupied territories was being killed by an Israeli soldier. And I mean that seriously. Now that filled me with dread. But that was a rational fear. They're crazy. <coughs> Thank you for being here. You are a courageous man. And I just wanted to ask, um, based on 60 years experience, uh, with the state of Israel and for many of the reasons that you've pointed out tonight why should we have faith that Israel wants peace why should we think that Israel will settle on two countries side by side can you give us any kind of hope we shouldn't but why should we think America wants peace <laughs> you know why should we think that the Americans are willing to tolerate you know, principles of equality and justice around the world. They behave exactly as everyone knows they behave. They behave like complete gangsters, murderers, and thugs. But that doesn't mean we then say the United States shouldn't exist. We work within the framework of our society to make it as just as we're able to make it just. And I don't see any reason whatsoever to start, you know, inventing new standards for Israel. I mean, we have to be honest and a little bit, I guess, humble about it. Okay, I'm the first one to admit Israel has committed massive atrocities against the Palestinians. But the numbers show about 650,000 to 1,300,000 Iraqis have been killed in the last five years. Whatever you want to say about Israel, it doesn't even remotely compare. So let's not all of a sudden you know, talk about what Israel is willing to do. You know, as Americans, we should be a little bit humble about what our government is willing to do. I mean, each moment we have to tremble what country they're going to blow up next, attack next, invade next, on the stupidest pretext, send missiles over you know, Mr. Uh, Clinton is going to have a hearing with Monica Lewinsky, so what is he going to do? He'll blow up a pharmaceutical plant in Africa. And that's how our country behaves. Um, good evening, sir. Uh, hey, sorry. Uh, this is going to be the last question. Let's yes. go ahead. Good evening, sir. Uh, I think you're not alone in your rhetoric. You have been factual and academic at best, not like, you know, partisan. And that's the biggest problem in the Middle East because most of the people are, you know, on this side for religious reason, ethnic reason, etc. But to me, uh, Jews, Arabs, they are all Middle Eastern, and they should try to find a 
common ground and solve this problem as written in by Shimon Peres, uh, the New Middle East. And about, uh, there are a lot of lies, a lot of uh, invention that reality and academic and history contradict. But what I'm saying is, like, if what you said, if you read the book by Richard B. Kramer, How Israel Lost, is mm -hmm. on the human rights issues. Uh, and I will make a difference here between the Jews who are honest, good-hearted people who are citizens of Israel and what the government does. Mm -hmm. So he said, uh, how Israel lost its on the human rights front. And there is no use saying you are a Jew if there is no human ache, human ache left in thee. And what he said about uh, human rights abuse, the chief justice of Israel said it, what's going on in the occupied territory reminds him of what he lived in Warsaw with his grandmother. And what he said, the general who is chief of army said it too. The chief rabbi of Israel said it that what we're doing in the occupied territory is anti, against the tenet of Judaism. So, but uh, I would just say maybe the Palestinians need somebody as courageous as you to find a solution to the problem. Well, you know, I, I'm glad that people think I'm courageous, but that's not false modesty. I'm not. We have to have a realistic sense of what courage means in the real world. Uh, you know, you have kids in Gaza who go out, throw a stone at a tank and get their heads blown off. What do I do that compares to that? The fact of the matter is, we're very safe here. We enjoy a lot of freedom here. And the problem is we don't exercise those rights in order to try to make this world a better place. But we shouldn't fool ourselves with these claims of being brave and courageous. The worst thing that happens here is, okay, you lose your job. And it's not great, and I'm not going to say I'm happy about the fact that I'm unemployed. But I really don't consider it a tremendous sacrifice. I'm healthy. I've led a good life. I pretty much got to do what I did with my life. And then when I talk to my friend Musa, who believe me, he is the most decent, I know it sounds like a cliche, but he is, the most decent person I've ever met in my life. He's my age. And I remember he once said to me, it was about five years ago, and he said to me, you know what? Uh, I have never had one happy day in my life. And I think that was true. He showed me where he grew up, a tiny little hovel in Fawar refugee camp. And his father was actually quite wealthy in the camp. And the Israelis came and took everything away in 67. And he was reduced to real humiliation. Uh, and the family suffered terribly because of it, uh, and now that's real suffering. I see it, you know, I see what, how people's lives have been destroyed, and for those of you who are college age, 20 years old, imagine your whole life from zero till today, all the events that happened, the birthdays, the dates, the parties, the diplomas and everything, and double it, double it, 40 years. That's the occupation they've lived under. It's just horrible. Uh, and so instead of celebrating my courage, alleged courage, I think what we really should do is recognize uh, how good we've had it and how in fundamental respects we're failing people who desperately need our support uh, and who I think if we did what we should be doing, actually there's a good chance that we can succeed in bringing some happiness to suffering people in the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm.